It's crazy to me that after nearly 40 years, Princess Peach has only had two starring roles in video games. Sure, she's appeared as a playable character in core series titles like Super Mario Bros. Wonder and Super Mario 3D World, but this is the Princess of the Mushroom Kingdom we're talking about. By the time you're watching this, we're on the cusp of Princess Peach Showtime, the second ever starring role for the Mushroom Kingdom's leading lady. The stage and performance backing of the game is a neat callback to Super Mario Bros. 3, while also giving Princess Peach her own flavor of new gameplay. I wish I could say the same thing for Peach's previous game, the Nintendo DS's Super Princess Peach. Developed by Toast and Nintendo Software Planning and Development, Super Princess Peach is a 2D side-scrolling platformer with a twist. Instead of traditional power-ups like Fire Flowers and Super Mushrooms, Princess Peach's abilities come from her emotions. Bowser and his minions steal the Magic Vibe Scepter, which has the ability to command emotions, and in a twist on the traditional formula, uses its powers to kidnap Mario and Luigi. After a Goomba loses control of the Scepter, everyone in the Mushroom Kingdom, including Bowser and his minions, get, well, em emotional. So now, it's up to Princess Peach and a sentient parasol named Perry to track down Bowser and save the bros. Perry's backstory is slowly shown over the course of the game. Every time you complete a world, a little bit more is revealed. I don't mind the approach as much as I mind them constantly repeating the same scenes. It's not as though his backstory is some huge revelation. He's a boy that got turned into an umbrella by some meanies. There's also the character of his grandpa, who's a nice man, and that's just about all we ever learned, too. So the main focus of Peach's moveset is her vibe powers. Peach has five basic emotions. She has her normal state, which she's in by default her joy state, which makes her frolic through the air and spin like a tiny tornado. You can use this move to reach high places or get some big cloudy guys out of your way. Next is Gloom. Aww. She's just really comically sad. Tears come flying out of her eyes like waterfalls and she runs really fast. This lets her grow flowers and run across fast falling platforms. Then there's rage. <laughs> All of the pent-up aggression from years of playing third fiddle to the Mario Brothers comes to the surface and ignites her body with pure Super Saiyan fury. This creates a shield around her body that instantly kills enemies and sets flammable objects on fire. After feeling the extremes of each core emotion, we're left with Calm. Calm puts Peach into a zen-like state that automatically heals her HP over time until her meter runs out. The concept here is interesting. Unfortunately, that's all I can really say about it. The game just never does anything to evolve the use of these abilities outside of what I mentioned above. You're gonna tornado a cloudy guy away, you're gonna light a fuse, you're gonna water a plant, but it never goes beyond that in any meaningful way. The enemies are also experiencing some intense emotions because of the game's plot, and while that's neat, you don't often see more than just an angry paratrooper charging you down. It would have been really cute if maybe there was a short side story in a level with an extremely sad toad. He's crying so much that the surrounding village is flooding, so Peach needs to find a way to calm him down and cancel the Vibe Scepter's power over him. I know my example goes beyond the scope of what they've made here, but that's just me asking for anything, really. I should mention that you'll use your Vibe powers during boss battles, like having to fill Petey Piranha's belly with water, just like you do in Super Mario Sunshine. That's neat! That's interesting! Let's do more of that. I'd like to say my complaints stop here, but... Oh boy. They don't. The level structure is fairly basic. You run from left to right, platform over simplistic platform structures hitting blocks, stomping Goombas, and swatting enemies with parry. This is all well and good, though it'd have been nice for Peach to have something a bit more unique to call her own, which thankfully seems to be true of her newest game. What I find most odd about this game is just how much it borrows from Yoshi's Island enemy sprites, platform designs, sound effects, and even the goal ring to some extent. Even the egg blocks are here for some reason. Why? Seriously, why? This isn't a Yoshi game. I feel like this game's having an identity crisis. In all fairness, these sprites and designs hadn't been seen since the original Yoshi's Island at this point, as Yoshi's Island DS was still around a year away when this game launched. Unless we count Yoshi Touch and Go. I don't count Yoshi Touch and Go. There are even Yoshi's Island style transformations for Perry, and I actually really like these. My favorite is the Slidebrella, which in reality is just Perry flipped upside down and hanging from a rope. 
Peach rides inside while Perry zips along, flipping from rope to rope. These sections only appear a handful of times, but they're really fun when they do. There's also the Subbrella transformation, which is just insane. The game was already borrowing a lot from Yoshi's Island. Why not just steal an entire transformation while we're at it? These just serve as standard underwater sections, though it is funny that Perry turns into a submarine. Of all of the transformations, he actually does transform with this one. Oh hey, it's Torpedo Ted. And a sea urchin. Hey, there's a lot of Super Mario World enemies here. Is this Super Mario World 3? Is that the message they're trying to send? Similarly to how I feel about Yoshi's Island DS, in that I think the music sucks, the music in Super Princess Peach sucks, man. This is the elevator music of video game music. It's really just there to make noise. It's not terrible, but it's not exactly inspired either. I don't find myself humming these tunes as they're just not memorable. As you're adventuring, you'll collect tons and tons of coins. A good way into Brandon's heart is to give me a reason to collect coins beyond gaining extra lives. In fact, this game has no life system at all. But the more interesting thing is the item shop. You can spend your coins on a small variety of neat stuff. The coolest are the extra abilities for Peach. There are three abilities you can buy. First, there's the float umbrella, which lets Peach float in the air using Perry. Honestly, it's a bit odd that you can't do this from the beginning, but at least it's here. Next up is the pound umbrella, which is basically a ground pound. Peach points Perry towards the ground and smashes his face into the earth below. It's a little mean-spirited, but Perry doesn't seem to mind. Finally, there's the charge umbrella, which lets Perry charge up a small beam and fire it at enemies a short distance away. This is the only move of the three that I don't find to be essential. And the pound umbrella is already towing the line for that. It'll certainly make dealing with enemies easier, but the game isn't difficult enough to really warrant it in the first place. But an upgrade is an upgrade. They feel good to get. And speaking of upgrades, you can also purchase extra hearts and extend your vibe meter. The game isn't that difficult, so you might not need the hearts, but it is handy to have more vibe meter. And thanks to the new Calm Emotion, you're basically increasing your health when you increase your vibe meter anyway. Perry can also eat enemies to refill the vibe meter during gameplay. Simply pick one up and then press down. Another Yoshi's Island thing, huh? Then watch as life is sucked out of the tormented soul as they spend all of eternity swirling around in the depths of Perry's insides. Real charming stuff. The worlds are what you'd expect from a Mario. I mean, Peach game. The same basic level themes we've come to know and be tired of are here and accounted for. We have deserts, the beach, grassy plains, it's all here. Worlds are made up of six levels, five platforming stages, and a boss. But before you fight the boss, you have to play a touchscreen minigame. This was the height of the DS era, so this makes a lot of sense. They're not that great, to be honest. One has Peach running on top of a rotating log to ascend a wall, but on the way up, you have to avoid taking damage or you have to start over. To move, you have to spin the log in circles and make sure to stop before you get hit. It's nothing to write home about, inoffensive at best. The boss fights are decent in their own right. I mentioned it earlier, but you'll use your vibe powers to reveal an enemy's weakness before delivering a damaging blow. Admittedly, the second boss fight confused me a bit. You see, I was under the impression I had to wait for this big owl to stop doing stuff before I tornadoed him. You'll see in my gameplay, I just kind of futz around for a while before realizing you can just kind of do it whenever you want, and then deal damage. The game isn't trying too hard to stop you, but that's fine. The designs are good enough and honestly more interesting than what you'd find in any new Super Mario Bros. game, the first of which was only a few months away from this one. That brings us to the final encounter with Bowser. Let's just hop on in here and, uh, wait. Why can't I start? Before the final battle, you need to rescue all the toads from past stages? Don't you think you should have mentioned that eight worlds ago? All right, so I was waiting to bring up the toads because I'm honestly still mad. If you watched my playthrough on Patreon, you saw my reaction to this in real time. I think this is a fine thing to ask the player. But in most Mario series games, the three collectibles in a stage are an optional find, not a requirement. If the game mentioned this at the beginning somewhere, I definitely just missed it. There are plenty of stages I did find all three toads, but a lot of these levels just go on for so long, outstaying their welcome without offering much of interest to do along the way. 
So over the course of my playthrough, I just started getting through the game as fast as I could, because I wasn't enjoying it that much. And what do I get? A nice big slap across the face. I'm not going to subject myself to this. This'll do. So Peach finally reaches Bowser, and they square off. But as usual, Bowser won't take this sitting down. Literally, he won't. He just floats away. And he makes you fight an angry Hammer Bro and his army of not angry Hammer Bros. It's honestly pretty funny seeing Peach destroy all these Hammer Brothers with her Super Saiyan rage. Once you've beaten them, Peach decides she also won't take this sitting down, and floats up in the air to where Bowser is. Bowser decides to take a page out of Wario's book, and uses a shoulder charge to attack you. He also has his typical moves like ground pounding and shooting fireballs, dodges moves and Super Saiyan him away. Once you've beaten him, the game decides to be Yoshi's Island one last time, and Bowser transforms into Giant Bowser. He fights from the background just like in that game too. In this phase, you have to dodge his meaty paws and spiky balls. He'll conjure hammers and shoot fireballs at you for good measure. When he slams the ground with both hands, a bunch of bob bombs will fall from the sky, giving Peach the opening she needs to win. Scoop these boys up and toss them into Bowser's face to tickle him just enough to make him let go of the ledge and slowly descend down into hell, never to be seen again. Well, not literally. I do love this shot of Peach golf swinging Bowser out into the distance. This is good stuff. If anything, this game's animations are charming. After this, Peach saves the bros, ignores poor Luigi, and then the Vibe Scepter floats high in the sky to ask us the most important question. So how did you feel about this adventure? I hated it. Okay, maybe hate is a strong word. Super Princess Peach is just not a very inspired game. The level designs are kind of boring, the game doesn't really challenge you at all, and the music's a little uninspired. Fine. None of those things make this game a bad game. It's just that none of these things are doing anything to make this a good game either. If we were rating this on the old Good Vibes Gaming rating scale, this would probably be a no vibes for me. What teeters it into bad territory though has to be these vibe powers. They're just not that interesting. Because even with them, the game just kind of lacks an identity. It dips its toes too far into Super Mario and Yoshi's Island instead of trying to make something new and different for Princess Peach. I think the bottom line, Princess Peach deserved better. And while I haven't played the full game, the demo for Princess Peach Showtime at least shows me that that game is trying something new, giving Peach something all her own. Alright, that's all I've got. If you want to see my full playthrough of Super Princess Peach, minus the final boss fight, you can do so by joining the Patreon at the producer tier. If you like what you saw here, please subscribe and let me know what your favorite game featuring Princess Peach is. It doesn't have to be a starring role game like the two I've talked about today. It can be something like NES Open Tournament Golf. Sure, let's go with that. Alright, until next time, keep the games good and the vibes greater. See ya!